Welcome to the second session of our academic year, 2021-2022. Um, our talk this evening is given by Professor Robert Burke of the University of Iowa, and he will be introduced by Bob Scott. That would be me. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's uh, really wonderful to have Rob back in our midst. Well, he's not in our midst, he's in Iowa. But, uh, but uh, he's a familiar figure to all of us who are regulars of the Serum Seminar and a much admired one. Uh, uh, for what it's worth uh, and for my money, I consider him the leading expert on the topic. I'm not one who's ever been asked to make that judgment, but if I were, that's what I would say. Uh, you may have heard about his what I consider to be his monumental work, which is the geometry of creation. Uh, and I think by now it's considered to be a classic in his field. Uh, it articulates and explains in amazing detail the role of geometry in the design of Gothic architect, uh, architecture through the study of German Gothic cathedrals. And in a kind of detail like none other, it's the kind of analysis that kind of takes your breath away. Uh, you may know that Rob came to the topic of gar got Gothic architecture in a roundabout way. Uh, he was an undergraduate at Harvard University, at a university I assume some of you may have heard of, uh, but he majored in physics and was on track to start doing graduate work in physics, and to that end went to uh, UC Santa Cruz, uh, where he got a master's degree in that field. But earlier on, as I recall, he had visited one or several Gothic cathedrals and was smitten and never really quite got over it. So when he finished his master's degree, uh, and I would assume uh, while at Santa Cruz under the uh, uh, influence of our very own Virginia Jansen, who I think helped uh, uh, reignite his longstanding interest in cathedrals. Uh, he then relocated to Princeton uh, to study under Robert Mark. And if you know anything about Robert Mark's work, he's a professor of civil engineering and architecture who kind of pioneered the application of modern engineering modeling to the study of structures of medieval buildings. So once he completed his PhD, there was no stopping him. He soon published his first book, which is Great Spires, the Skyscrapers of the New Jerusalem. And that was followed by three other major works, including the aforementioned Geometry of Creation. Now, I first met Rob um, through Virginia, uh, and uh, by this time I had left Princeton. He was still doing graduate work, but I vividly recall our introductory conversation, which took place at Princeton. Julie and I were there visiting her family. He was, uh, Rob was completing his doctorate, uh, and uh, we met in uh, Julia's family's living room. Uh, and uh, I was immediately struck by uh, uh, what an outstanding scholar he was and how much he knew about this topic. And I followed his subsequent work with great interest and admiration and was later um, fortunate to encourage him to apply for a fellowship at the Behavioral Sciences Center where I had worked for many years. And he was in fact awarded a fellowship there in 2006, 2007. Now, something I've never told him, uh, but what I'm about to explain to all of you, I hope I don't embarrass you, Rob, is my reasons for urging him to apply to the center were very selfish. I wanted him around for an entire year to give me yet another person to talk to about one of my favorite topics. And in addition, uh, having gained at least some a uh, bit of uh, exposure to scholarly works of medieval architecture, culture, and history. I have always believed that folks in my fields, the social and behavioral sciences, 
who are largely ignorant of these uh, studies by medievalists have a great deal of importance and value to learn through exposure to the work of, uh, of medievalists like uh, Rob. Uh, so having him around the center for a year absolutely confirmed my belief. I have no idea if he felt his work benefited from being a center fellow, but I can tell you that the work of his fellow fellows was greatly enriched by his presence. Uh, as for myself, about the most I can say is that my own admittedly amateur attempts to try to understand Gothic uh, uh, architecture, which I finished, alas, before his work began to appear in print, would have benefited immensely from exposure to his scholarship. And I'm very sorry about the timing on that, because I might have ended up writing rather a different kind of book. So tonight's seminar is going to be about French Gothic. I guarantee that he, he, his take on it will probably transform our understanding of the topic. And so I'm going to turn it over to you, Rob, and you can have at it. Well, my goodness, thank you for that super, super generous introduction, which I deeply appreciate. I just hope the talk can live up to it, which will be a pretty high bar. Um, it's wonderful to be back amongst you insofar as I can be amongst you from Iowa. It's really a pleasure and I hope we can continue the dialogue. I should say that I'm in the process of trying to get back your direction through fellowships as well. So maybe if the, the gods are kind, we can see each other in person. But anyway, we'll stay on with the Zoom correspondence in any case. So what I want to do tonight is to share with you some work related to a book project that I'm just embarking upon um, that also is feeding into my current fellowship applications for Stanford Humanities Center and once again oh. for CASBIS. So this book relates pretty closely to the ones that I was working on when I was out at CASBIS in 2006, 2007, because at that time I was interested in the geometry of Gothic as revealed in architectural drawings. And I was also working on a beginning phase of a book on late Gothic architecture. So in my new project now, I'm going to be turning to look at the first century and a half or so of French Gothic from around 1130 to 1280. So tonight what I want to do is to share with you some of what I consider to be the high points of my work in progress on the first century of this material from roughly 1130 to 1230 or so. So let me um, do the screen share, which is not yet operating. Um, let's see. Should be your co-host. Okay, let me just get it going. Okay. There it comes, good, got it. Great, okay. So if everything's working properly, then you should be seeing two ground plans and an elevation. Yeah. So. Right, so I want to begin with the two buildings whose plans you see at the left, namely Saint-Martin-des-Champs in Paris and the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis. I'll then work through several other early Gothic and high Gothic examples before concluding with a discussion of the changing design history at Reims Cathedral, whose section you see looming on the right there. I'll be talking mostly about geometry this evening, but rather than going through that material in detail, I'm gonna skim pretty quickly, try and emphasize some of the interesting bottom lines from each of these little case studies. And I should say, I'll be very grateful for any feedback you have about which of these items is coming across clearly and which ones really demand further explication. So I wanna begin by looking at Saint-Martin-des-Champs, whose exterior you see now on the right. This has always struck me as a pretty awkward church, both in plan and in external appearance. The plan looks rather disorderly to me with all the chapels of different sizes, different orientations, and with the large trefoil head of the axial chapel sticking out conspicuously. Upon greater introspection, however, I realize that the plan does have some method to its madness. If you strip away the outer shell chapels, you're left with something that resembles a rotunda, something like the round church in Cambridge, England, with which many of you are no doubt familiar. More specifically, we can see that the middle of the choir at Saint-Martin-des-Champs resembles a hexagon measuring a little over 14 meters from corner to corner. 
The alternating rectangular and triangular cells of the ambulatory vault come off the sides and the corners of that hexagon, respectively. At left, you now see the interior of the choir with its strongly rotunda-like character and very broad proportions with a short clear story. In geometrical terms, the width of the ambulatory at saint martin de champs can readily be found by inscribing a hexagon within a circle twice as wide as a central choir. If we draw an equilateral triangle tangent to that figure, we'll arrive at exactly the length of the axial chapel. I found these results to be very surprising and also exciting because they hinted to me that the church had been built with more geometrical precision than I'd guessed from its irregular shape. Mm. It seems to me that the radial distances are very precisely controlled in saint martin de champs even though the angles around the arcs show a greater degree of variance. This dimensional control of the radii is important because it allows me to then analyze the geometry of the section as well. So here now on the right, I'm showing you the correlation between the laser scan plan and laser scan elevation produced by Andrew Tallon, who helped to pioneer this scanning field before his untimely death in 2018. As you'll see, the section of the church derives from the shaded triangle arising from the dimensions that are established in the plan. More specifically, every salient level of the elevation can be found by the intersection of vertical drawn up from the plan with the line of 60 degree slope following the edges of that shaded 30, 60, 90 triangle, which is half of an equilateral triangle. I find these results interesting not only because of what they say about Samaritan de Chalons itself, but also because they help to give some insight into the architectural culture that produced the first Gothic buildings, including Saint Denis Abbey. I now show you the ambulatory of Saint Denis on the right. Of course, we're missing the top part of Saint Denis as built for Abbot Suger in the 12th century. So I'll work my way out from the bottom. It's important to recognize that the plan of Suger's famous choir was already established in the construction of its crypt. As you can see on the left, the upper chapels share the plan of the lower chapels. However, as you now see it right, the articulation of the crypt was very different than upstairs, having a more Romanesque feel with rounded arches. I want to call your attention in particular to the thick and heavy arches that separate the chapels from the crypt ambulatory. These arches will be crucial for my geometrical analysis. So here now on the left, I show you the plan of the crypt on large scale with the plan of the upstairs appearing in smaller scale at the top right. Excuse me, Rob. Yeah. We're, we're having trouble here at our house seeing both the left and the right. Is that our problem or is that a sending issue or what's the... Um, you should be seeing the crypt plan large with photogrammetric sort of striations on it. And then the upstairs should be very small and simple black for the buttresses. I think I could help it. What are you seeing? Uh, the crypt plan with the, with the little topo figures on it. That's the important part. Okay. Um, I don't know what's up. I'm seeing the proper thing on my screen. Um, if you find something I'm saying doesn't correlate with what you're saying, please let me know because that, that could become painful. All right. So let's concentrate anyway on the, the crypt plan. And that's where the action is for the time being. So I'm going to pick up those heavy arches that I mentioned uh, in band of shading. And I'm also coloring in with shading the round plans of the four Western chapels. So with that information in hand, we can unambiguously look at the centers of each of those circles. And we can find the radius of the semicircle through the chapel centers. And diagonals tangent to that semicircle converge on the axial buttress at the top of the image. I should note before going any further, the geometrical analysis that I'm presenting here derives from the work of Richard Nash Gould, who formerly assisted Sumner Crosby in his archaeological investigation of Saint Denis half a century ago. Gould recognized that the plan of Saint Denis was determined by dividing the crypt into 13.5 degree wedges, with two wedges or 27 degrees corresponding to each chapel. He further realized the size of the chapels could be found by extrapolating the squares out from their centers until their corners touched. 
Their interiors are set by circles and described as in those squares. Last but not least, Gould realized that the greater depths of the three axial chapels could be found by constructing the triangles that I've shown here in green, which have the proportions of the tips of pentagonal stars. Building on his analysis, I then observed that the width of the heavy arch could be readily determined by first inscribing 30, 60, 90 triangles inside the semicircle through the chapel centers. The width of the heavy arch is half the interval between the circle and the triangles. I can use a similar construction to locate this smaller shaded arc that serves as a basis for the columns of the hemicycle. The arch, which, excuse me, the arch width also helps me to locate the piers of the straight base. I should note that all of this plan analysis that I'm sharing with you is available on my website called Geometries of Creation, which is linked off of my University of Iowa faculty page if you want to follow this up. Before going on to consider the vertical dimension it sent to me, I want to call another witness to help get some perspective on the way the elevations were being established in the region in the middle of the 12th century. In particular, I want to look at the Church of Saint Germain des Prés in Paris, which I show you now at left, and whose plan appears at bottom right, or slow, I hope it does anyway. As you can see, Saint Germain has a more robust structure than Saint Denis, and its flying buttresses are originals from around 1150, as Andrew Talon demonstrated by measuring their deflection, which showed that they had moved outboard along with the choir wall. Now I'm showing you that ground plan in greater detail based on Talon's laser scans. Without belaboring the details, I'll just note that this plan is based on pentagonal symmetry, whose use allows me to establish all the radii used in the layout of the choir. This includes a wide arch strip between the chapels and the ambulatory, very similar to the one that we saw in the saint Denis crypt. At upper right, I now show you how the cross section of the church gets extrapolated up from the plan. You take widths established in the plan and use them as the base of a shaded equilateral triangle, very much like the one we saw at saint martin des champs Zooming in, we can see that geometry more clearly. You'll note that the keystones of the vaults coincide with the tip of the shaded blue triangle, and the slope of the flying buttresses coincides with the tip of the somewhat larger triangle shown in orange, whose base is set by the diameter of another circle established in the choir plan. This analysis of Saint Germain des Prés gives us an interesting perspective on what may have been intended for Saint Denis, to which I will now return. Here, once again, we see the chapels of Saint Denis showing the correlation between the structure established in the crypt and the structure of the choir at the main level. I've been able to demonstrate that the surviving portions of Suget's crypt and choir had elevations governed by equilateral triangles. These give important dimensions, such as the differences in height between the crypt floor and the main floor, the height of the columns and arches in the arcade, and even the width of the columns down to the centimeter. On this basis, I'm strongly tempted to imagine that the overall cross section of Saint Denis was governed by a large equilateral triangle, just like the ones that we saw at Saint Martin des Champs and Saint Germain des Prés the buildings that were gone just before and just after it in Paris itself. If so, then the choir would have been slightly lower than the one proposed by Sumner Crosby, as you can see in the contrast between my hypothesis at upper left and his on the right half of the graphic. I also believe that Saint Denis may originally have had flyers, not in the turning bays of the Chevet, where they were likely unnecessary, but only in the straight bays where the vaulting exerts much heavier load on each isolated support. There's one thing, excuse me, there's one other interesting thing about this triangle hypothesis. It turns out that the tip of that triangle at height 18.71 meters above the main choir floor corresponds precisely to the middle point of the rose window on Sujay's west facade. As my first Gothic mentor, Stephen Gardner, demonstrated several decades ago, the facade was the work of two different architects one who built the portal zone and the windows immediately above, and a second architect who built the rose window and the narrow windows flanking it. Having analyzed the geometry of the facade, I have convinced myself that the original designer intended for the facade to terminate below the rose window, as you can see at bottom left. This designer, I think, may well have been the designer of Saint Martin des Champs. He here uses equilateral triangles to set the height of the stories both in the central bay and the side aisles. I also believe that the Rose Window Story Chapel, 
which Suze described as being secluded, was higher than the level of the Carolingian roof. Further evidence for this hypothesis comes from comparison with the Cathedral of saint -Lis, whose facade was closely modeled on that of Saint-Denis. There, the diminutive rose window is indeed in a secluded place, so high that it overshot the original vaults. Now, to round out my discussion of early Gothic, I'd like to talk about the largest building of the era. I'm talking, of course, about Notre Dame in Paris, whose famous facade you see on the left. I'll start out by talking about the design of the cathedral's choir, which I now show you on the right. This plan is obviously based on concentric circles. A fairly simple recipe sets the relative radii of those circles, as the upper left portion of the graphic shows. If you start with the circle filling the apse and inscribe a hexagon within it, then the facial radius of the hexagon equals the width of each aisle. The same dimension acts as the length of the first four choir bays, as shown on the upper right. The fifth and final choir bay is longer, however, so that the length of the choir as a whole equals the height of the shaded equilateral triangle framed by the cathedral's original outer walls. The same shaded triangle was also used to set the cross section of the choir that you see at left. At upper left, I'm showing you the present cross section of the choir, including its current buttresses, which were rebuilt in the 14th and 19th centuries. Below, I show you what I believe to have been the original design, in which the slope of the fine buttresses at both levels would have been 30 degrees, coinciding with the geometry of the equilateral triangle. Next, on the far right, I show you that the plan of the nave was exactly twice as long as the plan of the choir, and that the length of the crossing bay was a quarter of that distance. This all strongly suggests the cathedral had a unified plan when work was first started around 1160. The nave, however, was built very slightly wider than the choir, a fact that impacted the design of the facade. Notre Dame's facade was begun starting around 1200. Although it at first appears very harmonious, if you look closely, you can notice a number of anomalies and asymmetries. The left hand or northern tower is slightly wider than the southern one by about a meter. So there are eight statues in the so-called gallery of kings there instead of just seven on the right. At the bottom right in my graphic, you can see those widths, which are 13.12 and 12.09 meters respectively. In the middle of this graphic, I now show you two versions of the west facade based on scan, once again, by Andrew Tallon. The top version is unmodified, with the north tower wider than the south. In the bottom, I have symmetrized the graphic, modifying the width to be what I believe they're supposed to be, based on the geometrical analysis developed in the choir. As you'll see from the sloping diagonal lines there, the proportions of the facade seem again to have been governed by the geometry of the equilateral triangle. The sloping sides of those triangles pass through the vertical axes of the towers in such a way as to define the heights of the main stories in the facade, which is to me a very striking result, providing strong evidence for my hypothesis about the originally intended tower width. It also makes me think that the whole facade was originally supposed to have a perfect geometrical structure based on the equilateral triangle. Even if this were the case though, the present facade design would not express the height of the cathedral structure behind it. At right in red, I show a roughly similar facade scheme that really would fit the body of the cathedral, shown in gray based on talon scan. Here the portals are shorter than in the present facade, so as to match the height of the aisles behind them. Instead of a short band of sculpted kings, the second story would be as tall as the galleries, with two windows in the tower bays to express the width of the galleries and three similar windows in the wider space of the main vessel. The bays flanking the rows could have had big single windows since there's nothing subdividing the space up there. The existence of an original design along these lines would help to explain an otherwise confusing inclusion of a small 12th century tympanum in the taller 13th century portal on the south side of Notre Dame's facade. This older piece, I suspect, was carved to fit the originally contemplated facade before their vision of design around 1200. This might all seem purely hypothetical, except that an exactly corresponding format can be seen at the Collegiate Church of Mont, whose elevation I now show you in the middle. I therefore strongly suspect that the design of Mont copies the originally intended design for Notre Dame in Paris 
as conceived in the 1160s. Here, right, just to prove to you that I'm not making things up, is the photo of the Mont facade as it appears today. Its articulation, I think, gives us a good impression of how Notre Dame was planned to appear. Notre Dame's current facade, though, departs from this format in both proportion and detail. So here, finally, you see my geometrical analysis of the current facade design, which is strongly based on the same shaded equilateral triangle that I've been discussing, but which also includes several permutations to take account of the fact that nave was planned slightly wider than the choir. So to conclude my discussion of early God, let me just briefly recap what we've seen. First, we've seen that the design of Saint-Martin-des-Champs makes much more sense than it would appear at first glance, since the plan is based on a hexagon and the elevation is based on a cross section based on the equilateral triangle, which is derived from that figure. Second, we've seen that the geometry of the crypt at Saint-Denis follows very closely on the scheme discovered by Richard Nash Gould. The upstairs of Suzé's choir likely had an elevation based on the equilateral triangle, and its vessel may well have had flying buttresses, but only in the straight base. The tip of the triangle, presumably giving the height of the choir, corresponds to the middle point of the rose window, which did not originally look into the nave interior. In the case of Saint-Germain-des-Prés, we have seen that the elevation is based on equilateral triangle derived from the plan of the choir, which had in turn been based on pentagonal symmetry. Finally, in the case of Notre Dame, we have seen that the cathedral was almost certainly begun with a unified scheme, giving its choir plan, choir elevation, nave plan, and west facade, all of which were based on the geometry of the same equilateral triangle. This scheme was somewhat modified in the course of construction, notably in the west facade, whose original design is likely reflected in the facade of Mont. So that recap concludes this short intermission. Now, in the second half of my presentation, I'd like to turn to the phase generally known as high gothic. I'll start with the Cathedral of Bourges, shown here, which has been widely and plausibly interpreted as an improved reinterpretation of design themes seen at Notre Dame in Paris. Several years ago, I undertook a geometric analysis of the Bourges cross section, as I show you at left, based on yet another laser scan by Andrew Town. The height of the interior was set, as at Notre Dame, by an equilateral triangle framed by the outer walls, while the height at the tip of the roof was set by a great square framing the whole composition. This is important to establish because I will show you in the next part of my talk that such roof ridges actually were part of the geometrical scheme in many other high Gothic churches as well. In any case, the interior height at Bourges was larger than any preceding church because the equilateral triangle in this case was based on a larger ground plane. Bourges just barely overtops Cathedral of Chartres as you can see on the left in this comparison with their cross section. As I mentor Robert Mark pointed out, however, the structure of Bourges is much lighter and more elegant than that of Chartres, which appears clunky and overbuilt by comparison. The uppermost flyers at Chartres in particular look oddly extraneous. As you can see in this view from the tower looking down, they sit on top of pyramidal structures that look like they were intended to be the terminations of the buttress uprights. Indeed, Ville Le Duc believed that the buttresses were originally planned without these upper arcs, as you can see it right. I actually believe that Ville was correct about this, but he did not go far enough. Let me show you what I mean. At right, you now see Talon's laser scan of the first story at Chart. His proportions are based on the figure of a pentagon and a concentric decagon, whose facets can be folded out to give the distance to the interior wall and window planes. Here I've added the next parts of the walls and buttresses. As you may guess from what I said a few minutes ago, I think this may have been as tall as the structure was originally intended to be. To reinforce that point, I here show you two significant triangles. The orange one is an equilateral triangle based on the width between the walls. The outer one in blue has the 54 degree slope characteristic of the Pentagon that generated the ground plan with sides aligned with the sloping sills of the aisle windows. It seems more than a coincidence that these two sloping lines converge at the same point, which I believe was the originally intended height of the vaults prior to the decision to make things taller, probably motivated by competition with Bourges. I believe we can see a similar narrative work in the Cathedral of Soissons, which is East End I show you now on the right. 
Soissons is famous as one of the first high Gothic cathedrals to use the classic double flying buttress system that would remain popular in France throughout the rest of the Middle Ages. Thanks to the use of this system, the Claire story could become very large, as you see on this interior view. But I asked myself once again whether this was perhaps due to a change of plan. If we imagine that cathedral had initially been planned with only a single battery of flying buttresses, then its foreseen interior would have looked more like the Church of saint yves in Brent, which I now show you on the left. Like Soissons, Brent features a three-story elevation, but with a much smaller clear story. I believe that Soissons may originally have been closer to Brent because of comparison with yet another church, the Cistercian Abbey Church of Longpool, whose cross section appears now in the middle of the screen. As you can see, its vaults are significantly lower than those of Soissons, whose cross section appears at the far left. In both of these graphics, the upper arcs of the flying buttresses look like afterthoughts, while the current buttresses seen at right have slightly different terminations. The graphics were prepared for Daniel Sandron, who wrote the most authoritative monograph on the cathedral. He believes that Longpont should be seen as a reduced copy of the original design for Soissons. I believe that his argument can be pushed even further, and that Longpont has a short elevation precisely because this format was originally planned for Soissons as well. The tall buttress uprights that we now see at Soissons would thus, in my view, have been built along with the tall clear story walls instead of being the fruit of a post hoc remodeling. We can get a valuable perspective on this problem by considering geometry. The cross section of Soissons was not based on an equilateral triangle as all the previous buildings we've discussed were. Instead, the crucial figure here is an octagon whose lower facet coincides with the floor of the choir measured between the axes of the arcade piers. The outer facets of the octagon coincide with the outer facets of the buttresses. The top of the octagon aligns with the gargoyles on the clear story wall, just above the height of the vault crowns. The midpoints of the octagon's upper facets coincide with the horizontal molding on the buttress uprights, which suggests that this level will seem as significant. I'm tempted to imagine this was originally the intended height of the vaults, which I've shown in red, since a vault placed at this height would spring directly from the triforium, just as at Longpont. Although that is the key takeaway from consideration of Soissons, I want to just briefly show you a bit more about how the geometrically crucial octagon works there. At left, I show you the cross section of the Soissons nave, which is a bit slimmer than the choir section shown at right, because the former lacks the half chapels that add breadth to the choir aisles. Here in both cases, I've added the master octagon just described. Note that its corners set the level of the arcade capitals. At that height, I draw a circle framed by the arcade axes and diagonals reaching up from the circle center. The intersection of the diagonals with the circle sets the height of the arcade. Above, I've drawn rays from the octagon center to its corners and to the facet midpoints. A few circular arcs in yellow then suffice to set the height of the triforium and the high vault within this armature. Here in green, I've just added the buttress arches and wall thicknesses. And here, finally, I show you that the height of the roof ridge was set by circumscribing a square around the master octagon and then unfolding its diagonals until they intersect with the building midline. The roof structure itself has 54 degree slope deriving from a pentagon, a figure that helps to set the plan of the cathedral uh, in ground plan, although I admittedly haven't shown you that. The revolutionary octagon based cross section of Soissons would prove to be hugely influential. One of the first buildings to manifest the impact of Soissons was Reims Cathedral, the building that I first fell in love with as a 12 year old visitor. Three years ago, I was able to fulfill a childhood dream by returning to Reims with a team of scanning experts, who you see at left, allowing us to make a full 3D model of the cathedral, shown at right. So in the rest of my presentation, I'll walk you through some aspects of Reims using our laser scan as a basis. Here's the cross section to the central bay of the choir looking west with south on the left. This part of the cathedral, the first story, was obviously built before the Clare story and high vaults of the central vessel, but the proportions of this zone offer valuable clues about the original design of the superstructure. Here I've just indicated the floor level of the ambulatory and the axes of the arcades. The height of the arcades equals the half height of a great octagon 
His lower facet corresponds to the base of the main vessel, measured from the height of the ambulatory floor. Lest you dismiss this as a coincidence, let me call your attention to several other relationships involving this governing figure. The lower lateral corners of the octagon align with the drip moldings on the buttress setbacks and with the bases of the capitals on the engaged wall piers. This is broadly similar to what we saw at Soissons a few minutes ago. The midpoints of the lower diagonal facets, meanwhile, align perfectly with the shaft rings on those piers, which mark the base of the shrunken wall passage behind them. I'm firmly convinced, therefore, the arcade story of the Rans Cathedral was built with this great octagon in mind. The choir vault now rises significantly above the octagon's top facet. Several independent bits of evidence, however, convinced me that the vault keystone was originally meant to coincide with the top of the octagon. First and most importantly, restoration architect Henri Deneux noted a slight kink in the curvature of the choir vault. As you can see in his illustration at left, he claimed that the continuation of the curvature seen in the Tadashash would have given a keystone about 1.7 meters lower than the one we see today. When we translate Deneau's graphics onto the laser scan of the choir at right, we see that this shift would have put the originally planned keystone even with the octagon's upper facet. Although Deneau was known as a careful observer of the cathedral's fabric, few subsequent investigators had a chance to verify his claim about a revision to the vault curvature, and some have expressed skepticism about it. To resolve this issue, I looked closely at the scan data from the choir vaults. The particular vault section here lies between the first and second bays of the choir, as you see in the plan at right. In both the vault and the ground plan, north is on the left. To measure the curvature of the upper transverse section in the arch, I located three points along its curve on the north side and another three on the south side. As you can see here, the red arcs drawn through those upper points curve less sharply than the lower portions of the transverse arch, so they pass outside the high capitals and their abaci. The effect is rather subtle on the south side, but a bit more pronounced on the north side at left. In the lower region of the Tadu I again located three points on each side of the arch. Here the discrepancy between north and south appears far more dramatic. While the southern Tadu describes an arc almost perfectly matching the intrados of the current transverse arch, the northern Tadu follows a much lower arc, just as Deneu had indicated. Although it is difficult to be absolutely precise about the intended vault height using this method alone, Several other clues strongly suggest that it was meant to align with the octagon previously described. So here we see an octagon once again superimposed on the laser scan of the choir's middle bay. And here by way of comparison is a laser scanned elevation of the cathedral's south transept. You'll note that the heights of the floor level, buttress setbacks and triforium base coincide perfectly in these two zones of the building. And the top facet of the octagon passes just slightly over the top of the rose window proper while passing below the thick pointed arch framing the rose. I agree with Alain Ville, who has carefully studied the cathedral's fabric and design. The frame of the rose was probably originally planned round, like the three rosette frames beneath the rose, corresponding to the lower vault height postulated by Deneuve. So here I've compressed the vault zone in the graphic at right, bringing the apex of the transverse arch even with the octagon's upper facet. In this scheme, the arcades would fill exactly half the total elevation and the Triforium and Clerestor would together fill the other half. This of course is precisely what Viard de Lecour illustrated in his famous elevation drawing of the nave interior and exterior. While this has often been dismissed as an error on his part, I strongly suspect that he correctly recorded the design as it was being planned during his visit. Viard may not have been an architect and his drawings look very different than the later medieval workshop drawings I've studied, but he was capable of being accurate when it mattered to him. You'll note, for example, that his drawing correctly records the level of the drip molding on the buttress setback, a detail unlikely to be captured in the casual sketch. At the same time, however, Viard was willing to stretch and distort the horizontal dimension of his drawings when it suited his needs. As the differently sized semicircles at the upper left indicate, he showed the interior bay is much narrower than the exterior. This flexible attitude toward horizontal proportions deserves particular note because it helps us to make sense of this drawing of flying buttresses 
supposedly designed for the Rouse Choir. As drawn, this buttress ensemble is far too narrow for the Rouse Choir. As you can see it right though, a horizontally stretched version of this drawing actually fits the shortened choir quite nicely. When the intermediate buttress upright is placed over the ambulatory pier, as it must be, the outer buttress upright stands directly above the outer wall, which seems quite plausible. The only strikingly bizarre aspect of this scheme, here indicated by the red box, is the way that the outer buttress would be dramatically truncated, creating a large horizontal platform in front of the pinnacle buttress drawn by VR. Since exactly the same platforms exist in the current choir, as the position of the laser scanned upright at left now shows, the presence of this rather distasteful anomaly at right hardly invalidates my interpretation of VR's buttress drawing. It seems likely, however, that the cathedral's original designer would have had something rather different in mind. To put this claim into context, it may be helpful to again consider the Cathedral of Soissons, whose choir cross section now appears at left. As we've seen, the Soissons workshop helped to pioneer the classic three story elevation seen at Rennes, with a large clerestory braced by flying buttresses at two levels. At Soissons, these flyers emerge from large slab like uprights that occupy the full width of the buttresses below, with their interfaces coinciding with the front edge of the ambulatory shafts. I'm strongly tempted to imagine that something similar may have been planned for Rennes. If so, the originally foreseen cross section of Rennes choir would have looked something like this, a clunkier but more straightforward arrangement than the pinnacled version illustrated by Viard or the even more elaborate one actually built. An analogous scheme could have been foreseen in the nave, as I show you at the left. To be clear, I am here adding these hypothetical flyers and uprights to my laser scan of the choir and nave bays, in which I have compressed the high vault and only the high vault so that its transverse arch keystones match the height of the great octagon, whose equator sets the height of the aisles. To complete this picture, I've here added a roof structure with the 60 degree slope characteristic of the equilateral triangle, a configuration often used or at least approximated in France in the early 13th century. This format, interestingly, puts the ridge rib of the roof right at the height of the rectangle generated by unfolding the diagonal of the great square framing the generating octagon. This is almost exactly what we saw at Soissons, except that the sweep of the arc there stopped at the building's center line, giving a lower roof ridge. Although it may seem that I'm piling hypotheticals on top of hypotheticals here, I actually believe this was the original intention for reasons that will become clear in a few minutes. In practice, simple slab buttress uprights were never built at Rennes. Instead, a far more decorative design was developed, featuring pinnacles larger and more elaborate than those seen in Viard's drawing of the choir buttresses. This is the scheme you see at the right, which is based on laser scan data of the current nave, which I've modified by shortening the uprights to match the octagon based height that I believe was meant for the vaults. You'll note that these Pinnacle of the uprights are flush with the exterior surfaces of the buttresses below without the dramatic horizontal setback we saw in the choir. These uprights are more slender than the swaths on the slabs, though. Their inner surfaces stand significantly outboard of the shafts and aisles, as the shaded area between them here indicates. As a consequence, the flying buttress arcs in this revised design are considerably longer than those shown in my hypothesized original scheme. Precisely such a distinction can be seen in the current building, where the long and richly articulated fires of the nave contrast to the smaller and simpler arc adjacent to the transept. I'm not claiming that this flyer is a fossilized remnant of the original scheme exactly, since the abutment levels would have been different, but I do find the contrast of modes here as tantalizing as evidence for revision of the Renaissance buttressing scheme. This revision process was surely motivated by competition with other cathedral projects underway in Northern France in the early 13th century. Reims had been planned from the outset with a taller central vessel than those of Soissons or Chartres, seen at left and center. But the Cathedral of Amiens, begun in 1220 and seen at right, was planned to be even taller. Before I go on to consider the direct competition between Reims and Amiens, please note that the lower flying buttresses in all three of these buildings meet the wall precisely at the level where the vault springs from the high capitals. Of those three buildings, Amiens would have appeared by far the tallest, 
not only because its vaults are so high, but also because slender pinnacles add to the height of its buttress uprights. To complete the picture, I have here added the roof to the full cross section of Amia, which brings the total height of the structure to just over 56 meters. Measured against Amia, my hypothesized original version of when I left would have looked rather squat, and even the revised version with the tall pinnacles would have come up short. So long as the vault height was set by the octagon and the roof constructed was a typical angle around 60 degrees, the total height of the roof line would have been considerably shorter than the Amia. But the builders at RAS had a few tricks up their sleeve. First, they increased the pitch of their vaults so that the keystones of the transverse arches now rise above the great octagon to meet the circles circumscribed around it. Second, they increased the height of the buttress uprights by adding blocks highlighted for the red box, thus raising the flying buttresses so that the upper one meets the increased height of the wall while pushing the lower one far above the spring line of the vault. Finally, and most ostentatiously, they built a huge roof structure with an unusually steep pitch so that its crest rises to just over 57 meters, a hair taller than an onion. This height, interestingly, can be found by unfolding the half diagonal of the square framing the generating octagon. The height of the Rans Cathedral roof thus relates to the width of the square by a ratio of 1.618, the so-called golden section. I don't claim that the incorporation of this ratio adds in any way to the beauty of the building, especially since its presence cannot be seen directly. But I do see the case of Renaissance as providing striking evidence for the use of this geometrical figure at large scale. And because the current roof height derives from the golden section rectangle formed by unfolding the square's half diagonal, I am tempted to imagine the originally planned roof height related to the square root of two rectangle formed by unfolding its full diagonal. It seems clear in any case that the Renaissance design was revised in order to compete with other cathedrals then under construction, most notably Amiens. That pretty much wraps up the new material I have for this evening, but in closing, let me just briefly recap what I discussed in the second High Gothic part of my presentation. First, Bourges Cathedral set a new standard of height because its triangular section was set on a wide base. The section of Chartres Cathedral was probably modified in response with the vaults likely building being built higher than planned, necessitating the insertion of supplemental flying buttresses. Something very similar likely happened at Soissons Cathedral, where the proportions are set by an octagon. At Reims Cathedral too, an octagon governs the section, but a series of revisions to the flying buttress design and even to the vault height can be discerned within this framework, likely to keep pace with Amiens. In these cases, therefore, you can see the relationship between geometry and competition, two of the major themes of my new book project. I confess that I haven't talked much about structure explicitly this evening, but it's clear that these increases in height and window size have important structural implications, which I will be considering in the book text. I hope you've enjoyed this quick tour of what I see as key highlights in the first century of French Gothic, and I look forward to hearing your questions and comments. Thanks so much for your attention. That's that. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Turn on my camera too. Uh, do we have questions from the floor? Or the vault? <laughs> I do. Bob does. He just raised his, raised his hand. I raised and, my hand. Yeah. Bob Nyden's ahead Bro of you, though. Okay. Bob Nyden. Let Bob Nyden go first. I just wanted to comment that I would have found it very helpful to have labels on each cathedral as you were showing them, especially when you had multiple ones and you would mm -hmm. change from one to the next to the next. It was real easy to lose track of which one was Soissons and which one was something else. Uh, just a little label at the bottom would be very helpful. Fair yeah. point, I like that. Mm. Uh, Bob Scott. Rob, insofar as I can make a judgment, I find your argument about the centrality of geometry very persuasive. But what is your take on why it, why it played such a critical role in the design of Gothic cathedrals? Basically because it had to, because if you're trying to create architecture, which is a system of order, 
you need some sort of ordering instrument and the ordering instruments they had at their disposal were geometrical, you know, straight edge compass is what they had. It just makes sense in a pragmatic way, I think. And it's, as I've found over the years, it's a very economical and fruitful way. And I remember discussing with you at CAS this years ago, this whole idea of form generation as a sort of algorithm or recipe, as opposed to form specification. Um, yeah. And so I feel like this is a way that they can have a developmental method, which is very agile and very flexible in a certain way while retaining clarity um, of method. It's hard to articulate in words, as I discovered trying to write about it, which is why uh, you. You know, people don't read it readily. But as far as doing it with your hands or doing it with a compass or doing it with the computer, it simply makes sense with what you've got laying around. So I don't think they had a lot of alternatives. I think that the Romans, you know, also had similar tools, but they didn't apply them in this recursive manner. Uh, whereas Northern, you know, jewelers and manuscript illuminators in a book of Kells, in some ways, were using geometry analogously. And so I would point to the work like of Robert Stevick, who has done work on Irish high crosses, very much in the same spirit as what I'm doing, um, but just at a smaller scale. Yeah. Uh, can I have one follow up? And then uh, uh, there, some of the materials I've read about this make it sound like geometry was arrived at uh, deductively from theology. But it sounds like what you're saying is that it was uh, developed inductively with a theological gloss on something that had to be anyway. Is that? That accurately characterizes my position. Um, that's what I think. Um, yeah. It should be noted that I am a scripturally illiterate atheist physicist. So uh, I, I see what I see and I miss what I miss. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, this is a non-theological yeah. design practice. It's a workshop practice that may or may not be glossed after the fact by Sujay or somebody else. But I don't see it as deriving in any significant I, sense from theology. And I feel like I've been able to make my analyses or make my peace with what I want to answer um, in the ignorance of a lot of that. So yeah. that's my limitations, but that's my perspective. Yeah. Lovely. Yes. William, you're up next. All right. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your full okay. disclosure, ex-architect. Um, we know that the master builders who did these um, did more than one on occasion, not one by one by one. Right. And did you ever find any material that would trace from one of your examples to another through either the guild that worked together or some of the apprentices or through the master builder themselves? That's a good question. And it really depends on the time frame and the milieu that you're talking about. I mean, these architectural pluralists who are working at four sites at once are well documented in the 15th and 16th and even late 14th century in Germany, also even in France. Um, and that's been what I kind of cut my teeth on in some ways with the geometry project, because that's also the period from which we have more drawings. When we get back into the 12th century, as I'm doing you know, with this project, the documentation record is much more meager. Um, so we don't have that kind of smoking gun evidence, but I think it is highly plausible that there were similar things. And that's why I said, for example, I am tempted to believe that the West facade of Saint-Denis was begun by the same guy who did the East end of Saint-Martin-des-Champs. They have a lot of the same things going on it would make sense for Sujet to pick the guy who had done 
nicest church choir in town at the time. Um, so I think that's probably already starting to happen. There's no doubt that it accelerates in the 13th century with the proliferation of parchment drawings, uh, makes it more easy for this kind of remote control architecture to happen. But I think it's already starting to happen in the 12th century is my hunch. Yeah, thank you. Virginia? Well, I have four questions, but I only ask one at a time. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure they matter that much. So um, uh, that was a good segue. And uh -oh. So you, you made um, the claim just now and before that because of the equal uh, that the was by the architect of Saint Germain, but um, that doesn't be a very solid argument. Um, I mean, putting there in other churches with equilateral triangles as the basis for their design, or can you? You're quite right. Yeah, uh, I'm not. I'm not arguing that they're the same based on the equilateral triangle. I'm arguing they're the same based on more traditional art historical formalist qualities that both the west facade okay. lower portion uh, at Saint-Denis and the choir at Saint-Martin-des-Champs are really thick and chewy and have multiple shaft piers and they have a mixture of pointed and round arches and they have many of the same you know, subjective flavor. So my sort of connoisseurial nose makes me think that. And the situation of what Sujet could have seen makes it seem plausible to me. So I'm not arguing that connection um, based on the equilateral triangle. Okay. Virginia, you want to ask number two also? Uh, well, you could come back, ask somebody else and then come back to me okay. about that. Larry Jones? Hello? Larry, yeah. Yeah, it's Larry. Um, yes, I've always heard that the medieval builders got their building techniques from the Romans. Is that true? Telephone game. I think they, they got it from the people who got it, who from the people who got it, from the people who got it from the Romans. <laughs> so it's, it's back there, but it becomes something very different. And so... Um, as I was indicating, I think the geometrical sensibility in particular is more informed by Northern practices of jewelry and manuscript and sculpture making because it's got this recursive fractal sensibility that the Romans didn't happen to pursue even though they used similar tools. And also of course, the Romans used a lot of concrete and the Gothic builders used a lot of ashlar stone, so that lends itself to different approach. The, the Gothic guys, up, at least in northern France, like I'm talking about, didn't have, you know, facings on concrete walls. So it becomes something very different, even though there is a kind of chain that gets you from point A to point Z. John Wilkes. Robert, thank you. I, I find these analyses amazingly satisfying when you sort of you put these geometric figures against these uh, sort of architectural diagrams and you go, wow, yeah, there's a match. Um, I wonder, though, how you defend against sort of you know, the numerology accusations. You, yeah. know, you tried 47 different kinds of uh, octagons, pentagons, etc., and found the one that matched. And, Whoa, yeah, that's right. Um, I, I'd be really interested in, in sort of what you think about that. First of all, there are no numbers, um, so it's not numerology, it's shape, you know, it's geometry. So there's that about that. So I'm not, I'm not looking for number symbolism, which is one of the things which some other people do. So that's, that's not me. If I'm sticking numbers on, I'm sticking on quantitative labels of saying, this is how many meters it is, this is how many meters it is. So it's a different enterprise that way. Um, your larger point that was absolutely on target and, and relevant. Um, the basic answer is that I've put in the hours and I have developed a sensitivity to how they did these things, 
based on, first of all, going through the drawings, the blueprints, for lack of a better word. Um, and you just ask yourself, how could this be done with the tools at their disposal? And when these lines are, you know, 1.414 times apart, and that's the square root of two to four decimal places, it's like, oh, that's persuasive. So I have to use taste and I have to use judgment. And I, it's, again, having done physics, um, it's like error analysis. What's the most explanatory power you can get with the minimum number of assumptions? And if you can do Copernicus instead of Ptolemy without as many epicycles, of course you can make the epicycles fit if you add enough of them, but that's not parsimonious, it's not Occam's razor, it's not elegant, it's not finally plausible. So when you get something that explains a lot to high precision with a minimum number of assumptions, that becomes persuasive to me. And so um, that's the answer in principle, but then the answer in practice is just that I've had to work on it for a long, long, long time. And I'm now seeing things and noticing things that I kick myself. It's like, why didn't I see this 20 years ago? It's like, well, I wasn't looking with the same eyes. Um, you know, now I look at the facade of Saint Denis, it's like, of course the rose window was not looking to the interior, duh. Of course, those big moldings on the buttresses are where it was supposed to stop. Duh, you know. Um, of course, the top flyers at Chartres are supplemental, um, as a lot of people have thought before. So it just has, it's evolved over time. And what I'm hoping is that by putting out the evidence in books like Geometry of Creation and then in the one that I'm starting to work on, and by making available these analyses where people can say, you got a better idea? Can you explain all these things with fewer assumptions or through some other mode? Bring it on. You know, I'm happy to see the counter proposals, but a lot of these things, there are no other proposals. Um, so I'm just saying what I see and I'm quite thrilled actually with how much I can explain with a minimum number of epicycles. So that's really the answer. That's Thank you, by the way. I mean, as an ex-physicist, I do find this very satisfying. So yes, I understand and appreciate the approach. <laughs> Roy Mize, I see your chat. Do you have a question? Yes, my hand. Uh, you've answered part of my question, but is it a logical extrapolation to figure that much of the knowledge is passed forward through the Eastern Empire. You mean the Byzantine or? The Byzantine, of course. I don't really think so, no. Um, th this, I don't see anything particularly like this happening in Byzantium. There's a very good analysis of Hagia Sophia ground plan, um, which is a little similar research method to mine, but what they're finding there is much more number-based and module-based um, as some of the researchers have looked at Roman stuff, which also of course makes sense since the Byzantines are coming out of that. Um, what I'm seeing in the Gothic, as I say, really has much more to do with what I'm seeing in the work of Robert Stevick on high crosses and manuscript pages. Um, so no, I frankly don't see Byzantium as a very close comparandum here. Uh, they seem Even to the Eastern uh, Italian churches that are basically uh, from the from the Eastern as opposed to Roman Catholic. I have not looked at those honestly. Um, what I have noticed is that I can certainly get these quote unquote northern geometrical modes into Italy at places like. Milan, of course, and Orvieto. Um, there's an interesting interaction between geometry and modularity uh, that my friend Matt Cohen has worked on, like in the churches of Florence, Brunelleschi included, uh, 
but I don't think I don't find myself thinking about Rome or Byzantium very much um, when I'm doing my my work here. It, it seems like what I'm doing is a different architectural culture significantly. Virginia, you're up again. Hi. Um, I don't know, uh, Rob, if you know that Peter Kitson's book will eventually be coming out. His wife is trying to finish up the footnotes. Unfortunately, he left those to the end, as most of us do, but then uh, they outlived him. And it'll be interesting to see what he says, but I think it, from what I hear, it probably goes along the same lines that... <coughs> I think that he understood a lot more about systems of measure than I do. Um, that is something that I have kind of purged from my method because it seemed like a can of worms. So I'm talking pretty much exclusively in terms of, uh, I, should, I should just clarify, for all of these analyses I'm doing, all of the figures fit together perfectly with no second assumption. I start with one dimension and everything else evolves from that one dimension. So it might be the crossing square, it might be the interaxial dimension of the arcades or whatever, but I start with one thing and everything else is measured in terms of that one thing. And so I'm not making any reference or allusion to feet or inches or modules or measuring rods or any of that stuff. Whereas I understand that Peter Kidson put a lot, lot, lot of attention into tracing the development of those over time. And that's something which I just frankly don't know much about. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what he, the book is actually about, but anyway. Um, so sometimes I notice the figure hits some very pertinent points and other times uh, it goes outside the line of the buttress or something else. Um, so can you explain how you can use a certain figure if not all the points work? Not all the points are supposed to work. You know, it's like saying, you know, I'm wearing a jacket that fits me tightly here but it has little shoulder bits that stick out, it still fits because it's not supposed to be a body stocking, it's supposed to be a sports jacket. So similarly, these geometries are supposed to generate dimensions that are useful in a given portion or portions of the building, but they may also wind up going some other places too. So if you swing a big circle outside your plan, you know, it may do some useful work for you, but it may also wind up some other place. And that's not a problem. Um, there's no cost, there's no utility problem with drawing an arc with a compass. When they did actually the, the drawings on parchment, they were very, again, parsimonious about what they did, uh, what they inked. So I should, again, just to be clear, um, I'm not saying that the draftsman would have represented a full circle or a full octagon or any of those things on the drawings. They didn't. Um, I'm showing explicitly things that I think are implicit in their design process. So if, if they used a square, I'm drawing the square. They only would have to tick with their compass, you know, point here, point there, point there on the drawing. So I am, I am showing you things that they did not show you. Um, and so I'm making lines that are outside the building in a way that they didn't and they didn't need to. But that's because I'm trying to complete the picture and make the, the figure visible to people when it hasn't been visible before. Okay. Larry, did you have another question? Your hand's still up. No, I didn't. Okay. Any others? Virginia, you have more, more to ask? But I haven't written down the answer for the last one yet. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway. Let me think here. 
Um, well, uh, so have you done very much looked into um, Romanesque um, ge geometry? And does it play a similar role to Gothic or is there an abrupt change, difference? I think that there is a lot of kinship. I haven't studied that many Romanesque buildings, but I have studied Notre Dame at Jumiège uh, at the request of Jim Morgenstern. And that analysis, again, is on my website. <clears throat> Very much similar to the Gothic thing. Um, they don't do the recursive fractal geometry as enthusiastically or as obsessively as the Gothic or the late Gothic does, but the basic principles are very similar. And especially in the towers at Jumiège, they use nested octagons and circles in a way that is you know, very characteristic of the late Middle Ages also. So my belief is that this method of doing things was pretty continuous from early medieval north, you know, again, Book of Kells, Book of Lindisfarne, High Crosses in Ireland, through the Romanesque into the Gothic with a lot, lot, lot of continuity. That is my belief. Um, again, the, the documentary record is lousy the earlier you get, but that is my belief. And another person I should mention besides Robert Stevick, who I've talked about, is um, Peter Johnson, who is a swordsmith from Sweden. And he has done proportional analyses of the swords and their hilts and their blades and the width and the length and all of this. And he has found very analogous structures in swords from the Viking age through the high and late middle ages. Um, so he actually had an exhibit at the uh, Deutsches Klingen Museum in uh, Solingen, all on swords, but they had a big reproduction of Cologne Plan F with my geometrical overlay on it to show that it's the same design principle. So it's not just architects, it's swordsmiths, it's jewelers, it's manuscript illuminators, I think all over the place. Um, that's my contention. So would, is there any geometry that you know of in um, the Carolingian building of, at Cologne Cathedral? I haven't looked at that. An early example. I, I haven't looked at Cologne, pre-Gothic Cologne. I mean, obviously there are analyses of um, Aachen Palace Chapel, um, which is Carolingian first part. Um, and that is octagon based, but also module based. But again, it doesn't have the recursive quality that I see starting already at Jumiège and coming into the Gothic. So I, I feel basically as though the toolkit is very continuous, but what people choose to do with it evolves. And it feels to me, and this is a kind of funny way to say it, and I wouldn't want to be held to this necessarily, but it feels to me like the architects started in the Romanesque and especially in the Gothic, developing a sensibility for using their tools similar to what the jewelers and manuscript illuminators had already done centuries earlier. That's one way to, to say it. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Any other hands up or speak up if you have a question? Of course, you have the issue in the gap between the um, say the, the, the principles and the jewelers and then the appearance with a strong usage, what do you call the recursive usage? Mm -hmm. Not to Romanesque, but... It, it's, not, it's not uniformly well-documented and it's hard to make the connective tissue. But again, my dad is a paleontologist, so evolution is a big thing for me and understanding pattern is a big thing for me and I'm not completely freaked out by quote-unquote missing links you know the the creationist critique of Darwin is always 
we're missing this fossil that comes between point A and point B. And then you find a fossil that comes in the middle and they're like, oh, you're missing the fossil that comes between this one and the middle one. Uh, you can never satisfy everybody all the time. But if you make the case for this being the overall framework for how it happens, then I think the more evidence you build up, the more plausible it becomes. And so I'm actually going to be doing a graduate seminar this spring, very similar to one that I did several years ago, where you know the students are forced to take my class because there's one seminar offered per year. So it gets called, when I'm teaching it, it's called the medieval seminar. But not everybody wants to study medieval. I know, shocking, horrible. But um, in order to make this differently accessible, I'm running it as a geometry seminar. Oh. And so I'm saying, let's start with Stonehenge. Let's start with ancient Egypt. Let's do Greece. Let's do Rome. And let's take it right up to 2000, 2021, whatever. And I will show you the way that geometry works in painting, in architecture, wow. um, throughout all of this yeah. stuff. And I believe this is the way it was done in Renaissance painting, in a whole lot of different areas. And again, I've got a, a ton, not a ton, but I have like a 20 or so Renaissance paintings that I've done this for. And, you know, the aspect ratio of the panels, it's like, 1.828, hmm, that's one plus two, it it's, comes from the square root of two. Uh, it's obviously, they're taking a square and they're opening the diagonal, that's just what it is. Um, and so I think this is the story of how pre-modern and some modern art was made. And I want to send up a big flare to that effect um, and try to get people's attention, which is not easy. People do not want to hear it. Um, yeah. But that's where I'm making my stand as best I can. Do you use any uh, 20 or 21st century buildings? Hirshhorn Museum, for example, trivial example, but the, I mean, it's just a ring, right? But the ratio between the inner and outer parts is just, square root of two, because they just took a square and drew circles on the inside and the outside. It's, it's you know, first grade stuff, but it just shows that they're doing that. Um, mm. It's what happens naturally when you have a circle sitting on four feet like that museum does. And that's just one example that comes to mind. Um, I've done, for example, Mondrian's Broadway Boogie Woogie, which is all done unfolding these things. It gets no, there are no curves in Mondrian, but all of the dimensions come from arcs, which he didn't draw and didn't need to draw, but I think William, you have a question? Me? Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. Um, Robert, I caution you uh, yeah. If you are uh, analyzing Renaissance painters, um, <clears throat> particularly with <clears throat> regard to Rembrandt, my wife and I visited <clears throat> Amsterdam a decade ago, and what we realized is that a lot of Rembrandt, at least two of them, the one right over the Rijksmuseum entry, the mm -hmm. gold counters, and the other one that you know of as the anatomy lesson of Dr. whatever his name is, both of those were chopped off by the patrons to fit the space and Rembrandt didn't, uh, he didn't cause any problems. So trying to do any, uh, you know, golden section analysis of them, which you know, I was trained in architectural school to look at everything like that. And <laughs> it don't always work out that way. You're right. I take the point, absolutely. But it's also great that, for example, um, Piero della Francesca's uh, Madonna and Child. Yeah, manners it, painting. It doesn't work in the proportional way if you were to start from the outside because it's been trimmed off. You can see the saint's elbow has been clipped. And if you 
infer from what's in the drawing or the painting what the geometry is, you can recover the dimension that it was before it got trimmed. So that's also a kick. But yeah, I take your point, absolutely. Yeah, I also recommend for uh, a, an investigation of the work of I.M. Pei as mm -hmm. a modernist who, who used classical proportioning uh, facilities to make his buildings really work. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. I just haven't done it yet, but yeah, thank you. Roy, you have another question? Roy? Yes. Uh, speaking from a base of absolutely no knowledge whatsoever, uh, but with a family history of going back almost 300 plus years in masonry, I'm not a mason, uh, if you buy into the Mason's mantra, is that a way that you think that uh, knowledge might well have passed? Which is the mantra? Well, I don't know. Basically, only what I've read. But the uh, skills of Master Mason, et cetera, all the way back into the early days, I mean, passed from one to another. Basically, yes. I think that one of the things that really struck me very hard when I was going through the two books that I was working on at CASB. So as I said, it was kind of a diptych because the one was about geometry in drawings and the other one was about the fate of Gothic in the Renaissance. And I wound up finishing the geometry one first. And so I developed this empathy for the geometrical method. And then I tried to write about it. And it is not fun to write about it. And it is not fun to read what I've written about it. You know, looking at the pictures is fun, but it's translating geometry into words stinks. Um, and I realized in the course of working on the second book that the same exact thing had happened to the Gothic builders as was happening to me, which is that they had something that worked beautifully in the Mason's Lodge that worked beautifully on parchment with a compass and a ruler, which works wonderfully if you're sharing it with a like-minded apprentice. And they did hand it down for hundreds of years and everything was going great. But then in the Renaissance, you get princes who start reading architectural treatises with words by people like Alberti and they start poking their noses into the process in a different way and they demand verbal explication and they want a different kind of theoretical justification. And that is asking something that the Masonic practice does not answer. And so the Masonic guys had nothing to say. Um, the, the Gothic Masonic guys had nothing to say, whereas Alberti had great talking points. And so I really feel like the, the triumph of the Renaissance or the crisis of the Gothic was very much a shift from workshop Masonic communication, which was practical and visual, to a print-driven, text-driven, verbal discourse-driven thing um, where the Gothic guys are not at home, but the princes and the courtiers and the rhetoricians are. So I think that's where I'd come down on it. Hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah, we should bring yep. us to close. Evelyn, are you with us? Yes, I'm still here. Hey, over oh. to you. <laughs> Thank you, Rob, we really appreciate this. And uh, we hope you'll be out here with us very soon. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. It's been wonderful and I hope I'll be out there too, but in the meantime, I'm glad we can at least stay in touch this way. This has been great. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, thank you all. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.